fast enough. Are we on one hour? Yep. Okay. I'd like to thank the second round of witnesses for attending today. Um, could each witness, starting from my left, uh, that is you, Mr Devlin, um, uh, please state their name and position, title, and swear either an oath or affirmation. Um, Tony Devlin or Anthony Devlin. Um, I'm the manager of Money Care, New South Wales, Queensland, the ACT <coughs> for the Salvation Army. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Ms Nasser. Uh, <coughs> I'm Nida Nasser, the State Director for New South Wales, Victoria and ACT at Mission Australia. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given shall be uh, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Ms Cook. Uh, Rhiannon, <coughs> Rhiannon Cook, Manager of Policy and Advocacy for Vinnies New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you. Um, would uh, you like to, any one of you, all of you, like to give a brief opening statement of not more than two minutes? Okay, I can Starting perhaps with you, Mr Devlin. Same order. Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation, on whose land and waters I live and work, and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge their continuing relationship to this land and the ongoing living cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. I'd like to thank the committee on behalf of the Salvation Army for the opportunity to present our evidence and share our experiences. Uh, our vision is that uh, wherever there is hardship or injustice, Salvos will live, love and fight alongside others to transform Australia one life at a time with the love of Jesus. We have uh, pursued this vision during the pandemic in a number of different ways. At the local level, we put together We Care packages as a small gesture to remind our communities that we're there for them. We are working with government and other organisations, including Mission Australia and the St Vincent de Paul Society to respond to emerging needs. We've also adapted our services so that we can continue providing essential assistance to communities across Australia in a COVID safe way. As early as mid-March, on the heels of the Black Summer bushfires, our strategic emergency and disaster management team was working with state governments, including the New South Wales government, to support the delivery of the essential supply packs to people who were self-isolating and did not have support to obtain daily necessities. The Salvation Army operates a number of residential facilities for people experiencing homelessness. Almost 50 residents at our foster house crisis accommodation, Surrey Hills, were moved into hotels to ensure that they had access to COVID safe accommodation, thanks to funding from the New South Wales government. Our existing collaborative relationships with Mission Australia, they submitted to the Paul Society and Wesley Mission, meant that we were able to quickly work out shared case management for these community members. As restrictions change here in New South Wales, we need to ensure that everyone who is being supported through temporary accommodation has a pathway to permanent housing and that they have access to support that they need to maintain that housing. The Salvation Army is also one of the largest providers of financial counselling and emergency relief in New South Wales and also provide no interest loans. We are bracing for the impact of the end of the deferral of the debt deferral periods, the moratoriums on evictions and energy disconnections and the end of the higher level of government support. The cliff may not now happen, however, we may have a very steep and long slope. We are conscious um, that more support may be needed as the long-term effects of the pandemic emerge. We are grateful the support of the New South Wales Government has provided to date, including the additional six million for funding for asylum seekers and people on temporary visas to the sector. Uh, the important Energy Accounts Payment Assistance Scheme, EPA, must continue to meet the needs of people experiencing hardship. As a long-term provider of the scheme, we would greatly appreciate, we would greatly welcome opportunities for input and collaboration with the department and other stakeholders to ensure that the scheme meets needs appropriately. Unfortunately, it appears that there will be a significant increase in people with severe financial hardship with unmanageable debt. We need to ensure that there will be sufficient financial counselling services to meet the expected demand in the months and years ahead. Financial counselling services have been shown to not only relieve financial hardship, but improve mental health and personal wellbeing. Our data in recent months indicates that our regional areas may be hardest hit. Our experience is that the promise of quick access to finance needed to get through the week can be very appealing to people in crisis. As people find themselves in more financial stress, 
perhaps more than ever in their life. We'd like to urge them to seek help from free community-based services like our Money Care program, rather than turning to predatory short-term loans which have a long-term detrimental effect. We encourage the New South Wales Government to consider additional protections for people potentially impacted by predatory lenders, as well as further developing support for the No Interest Loans program. We have a unique opportunity in a post-COVID Australia to make sure that everyone is visible and valued. We would like to see Australia advance as the economy and society re-emerge to a new normal state which will be better prepared and more resilient to future shocks. Thank you for your time. Ms Nasser. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before the committee today. I too want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and other Aboriginal people here today. Our Mission Australia is a non-denominational Christian organisation that delivers evidence-based, client-centred community services with a focus on ending homelessness, strengthening communities, and ensuring vulnerable people in need can thrive. Last year, Mission Australia supported about 65,000 people in New South Wales through <coughs> 268 services. We collaborate with government and with organisations like uh, Salvo and Vinnie's and, and others in the sector. Um, uh, we have adapted very quickly under extraordinary circumstances to prepare and respond, respond to this pandemic. A focus continues to be on supporting and keeping our vulnerable clients and staff safe. Uh, contributing to the community effort uh, to stop the spread of the virus and continuing to support vulnerable people, families and communities in need. We established a COVID-specific uh, crisis management team and we're continually revising our national emergency response uh, and planning. Uh, every one of our sites has developed a COVID-19 action plan, which is rec regularly revised to respond to changes in the level of infection risk uh, and government direction. In our residential services uh, specifically, our residential homelessness services in particular, uh, we have been working actively with the Department of Communities and Justice and other organisations to prepare our facilities and to support the, bro the broader effort of moving homeless people to safe accommodation. We moved most of our non-residential programs to remote uh, and distance service delivery, including phone uh, contact and uh, as well as uh, virtual service delivery. In relation to the government response, I'd really like to say that by and large, we feel the New South Wales government has responded well to the pandemic and to addressing some of the immediate uh, impacts on vulnerable people. For example, the collaboration between the Department of Communities and Justice and the sector around a homelessness respond and the resources that, that, that were followed to support things like leasing, uh, temporary accommodation, um, has, is, is really commendable. Um, as is the additional resources provided to mental health, domestic and family violence and the practical assistance provided to, to our organisations and other organisations to support additional cleaning, um, technology and those sorts of practical um, areas of assistance as we move to remote uh, service delivery. But there are areas that need more attention and uh, one of these is outbreak management in residential facilities. Mission Australia operates three aged care facilities for highly vulnerable homeless people, as well as a number of other residential facilities for homeless people, um, uh, uh, such as crisis and transitional accommodation, mental health services and rehabilitation uh, programs. We have put in place strong infection control and other preventative outbreak management measures, but these facilities are not funded nor resourced to operate like hospitals. We need clear protocols and commitment from New South Wales Health to hospitalise vulnerable older people and homeless people in residential and other facilities uh, who test positive. Other concerns that we have are about the impact of uh, the pandemic broadly on vulnerable people. We have seen increases in referrals to our family and domestic violence services, emergency relief, employment programs, and broadly the de deterioration of mental health and well-being of some of our, our clients due to the isolation. We, have also <coughs> we are also concerned about the long-term impact, uh, which we are yet to fully understand, but we know that that will be felt for many years to come. We need a long-term recovery plan to make sure that people already experiencing disadvantage are not left behind. 
We need more social services and programs to address this impact, not less as government looks to cut programs to fund the cost of managing the pandemic. We also want to see an economic stimulus package that invests in social and affordable housing, ideally with a target of 5,000 new homes each year for the next 10 years. This will create much needed jobs and reduce homelessness. Thank you. Ms Cox. I'd also like to acknowledge <coughs> that uh, we're meeting on Gadigal land, the land of the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge that crises such as this pandemic tend to disproportionately affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. And even if we've so far managed to avoid the more immediately and potentially devastating health impacts, mm. we know that the social and economic consequences will be far reaching. And so we would hope that equity, equity would be at the centre of all our recovery efforts. Um, so I'll start by telling you a little bit about Vinnie's in New South Wales. We provide services to people experiencing or at risk of homelessness and those experiencing problematic alcohol or other drug use. We support people with complex mental health diagnoses, behavioural support needs and people with disability. Each year, our 4,000 member volunteers also provide assistance in the form of financial and material support and care and companionship to approximately 60,000 people in their communities across the state. So while some of our services receive government grant funding, about 50%, a large proportion of our work is funded by revenue raised through our retail outlets and fundraising efforts. And it's supported by, as I mentioned, our significant volunteer workforce. I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, as Nada said, I'd like to um, say that we have appreciated the New South Wales government's focused response to people experiencing homelessness. And that includes the accommodation of many of the people who access our services in hotels and the recent Together Home commitment that will allow these people to move into two year head lease properties with relevant supports. But like many other organisations, we think that significant investment in increasing the supply of social housing is needed to make sure that efforts today translate into a long term and significant reduction in homelessness. <coughs> Many of our service managers report that during the pandemic, they've also really appreciated the collaborative and flexible approach that most funding bodies have taken. This in turn has meant that we've been better able to respond to the need that we're seeing in the community. Many of the steps that the federal and New South Wales government have taken to reduce the impact of the economic challenge on people at risk of hardship have also been appreciated. In particular, with the introduction of the coronavirus <coughs> supplement, we've seen a request in uh, support for material relief from people who would ordinarily access um, that service. Yet there are some significant gaps, particularly for people on temporary visas, including people seeking asylum and international students. As an organisation, we've taken a financial hit during the pandemic and a significant proportion of our volunteers have had to withdraw services. This has ongoing implications for the delivery of our services at a time when they're likely to be needed most. We know that unemployment is already high and rising. There will be an increase in financial and relationship stress and escalation in mental health and domestic and family violence issues. And our services report that in recent weeks, they're beginning to see increased presentations in need, including people who are walking through the doors who've never before experienced homelessness. So, the charity sector, we think, plays a vital role in the ongoing response to the pandemic, and we hope the New South Wales government will continue to acknowledge and to support that role. Thank you, Ms Cook. Uh, we might start with questions from the opposition. Ms Sharp. <coughs> uh, thanks very much. And uh, again, thank you for all of your what your organisations have done. I've been familiar with quite a lot of work happening on the ground, and there's been some true miracles that have been pulled off in the last in the last few months. Um, I wanted to ask you <coughs> about a couple of things. Um, one is that a lot of your services, pr you also provide drug and alcohol services, and one of the things that's been raised with me as an emerging issue is just the access to rehab be beds um, for people exiting prison, for, um, and you know, there's been sort of a general closure under COVID. I'm just wondering whether any of you would be able to comment on that. Perhaps Mr Devlin, I know I think the Salvos are closing your 70 bed rehab up at um, the Central Coast. Um, look, I, uh, 
If it's outside your area, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be tricky. I'm just no, no. That's, um, look, I'll have to take that on notice, I'm sorry, and, sure. and get some more detail about that. I, look, I know that we are... You know, the um, data that we're all seeing, of course, is that there's been a particular increase in um, online gaming and I think in the, in the purchase of, uh, of alcohol during this time, and that, uh, that certainly is a concern. But in terms of further detail about access to our facilities, I'd have to take that on notice. No, that's fine. But just gen um, any general comments around the drug and alcohol during the, what you're seeing in terms of the clients and the services that you provide? Yeah, our residential service closed its books for the, the initial period in the pandemic in order to manage, um, manage the risk. And since it's reopened, our referrals have increased and they've been high and ongoing. So there's a significant waiting list for that service. And it's been further complicated by border closures, which mean that people might not be able to access services that they otherwise could. Yeah, okay. And, and likewise, we've also seen an increase in alcohol consumption, um, and that has broader impacts, um, uh, you know, across a, a range of areas. Mm. Uh, in terms of our um, alcohol and other drug uh, facilities, we have a youth, two youth facilities, uh, and um, and there's there's always been long waiting lists for those facilities. Um, rehabilitation beds, generally in New South Wales and really across Australia, is a, is a, a major um, issue, um, and there's not. It's sufficient both detox and uh, rehabilitation services. Mm. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, in terms of the, um, the, 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 I mean, I think the head leasing, two years safe accommodation for some people would be um, very important. Um, are you able to give me an indication though of the support that you've received, how much of that funding has gone into sort of temporary hotel arrangements versus the sort of private head leasing arrangements? if you like. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I can't give you specific figures. Um, initially, the response focused very much on temporary accommodation yeah. and yeah. providing, uh, you know, moving people into hotels and motels, both from the street and, and from some of the high-risk uh, residential facilities as well. Um, more recently, the Together Home program is providing funding for head leasing and support to move people into long-term housing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure proportionately where the mix of the funding is. Uh, I guess what we have been advocating for right from the start is that we want wanted to move to the long-term leasing yep. approach right from the beginning. In fact, early April, we advocated that to the Department of Communities and Justice, saying we need a housing-first approach. Uh, hotels and motels are fine in emergency situations, but we really needed to move to um, long-term long -term housing, long-term leases with support as early as possible. Um, that's good. Um, can I ask you about, if you've had to do quite incredible work to moving a lot of your um, counselling and other services online. How have you managed the issue with just digital divides? So the fact that someone's got a phone, as you know, doesn't mean they necessarily have enough money or credit in the phone. It doesn't mean they have access to the internet. They're trying to homeschool kids at home. There's, you know, it's been a very complicated scenario. How Can you just sort of give the committee an idea of how you've managed that or, or, or recommendations to government about how we do better in that space? Look, I'm, I'm happy to, to comment about that. Um, our, um, our emergency relief and financial counselling services um, um, had to move out of our offices um, to, um, to working from home situations. Some of that is moving back in now under COVID uh, guidelines and requirements. But no, it has been difficult and um, um, we found video conferencing very, very difficult um, because most people most people that we're working with did not have access to video conferencing themselves. Mm. Um, and a lot of people, of course, still don't have reliable internet or any internet or reliable internet at home. And that is a, that is a the digital divide is well and truly there and it is a, a major concern. Mm. So most of our financial counselling and emergency relief conversations are happening by phone, uh, which is not ideal. Um, you know, we know that we do our best work um, or some of our best work face to face. Um, and difficult with people um, with people having conversations um, with people from home. It's also difficult for them too because they've got lots of distractions in the background, and it's also been very difficult for people from a non-English speaking background where we've been particularly we've, we've tried to use interpreters and that sort of thing. So now it has been very challenging. We're keen to get back into a face to face situation where we can. We are developing video conferencing better as we speak and we're doing some things now we weren't aware of in February, which is great, so it's brought things on, but um, it has been a challenge. Um, I think we've found that 
there's been a, a mix of some really positive things that have come about because of technology and also some, some real concerns. So some of the positive things are just um, that some service provision is, um, is easier and there's less time wasted. And also we've been able to reach people for whom geography would have been a barrier and allocate resources more flexible, flexibly to need. So where one area is full, we can allocate a staff member from another area and also providing continu continuity of care to people who might move out of the area. So that's been a real um, bonus. But there's also been challenges. Um, so for some people, it's the physical access to the equipment that is the issue. And that's, that's a really hard problem to overcome. Mm -hmm. Down at Matthew Talbot, we've got some iPads that people can come in from the community to access so they can access some of our programs mm -hmm. remotely on site. Um, but also the other thing is just the level of upskilling both of staff that's been really significant, but then them coaching clients through technology remotely when that's not their area of expertise. So there's been, that's been a really significant resource drain. Mm. Yes, yes, yeah. and, and sorry, just like my colleagues, um, we've also seen both challenges and uh, positives to moving to remote delivery. One of the big issues for us has been um, security of information and using the right platforms to ensure that um, privacy and security is, is uh, you know, um, uh, 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 our biggest priority. Uh, so th that has meant um, working really quickly to identify the technology platforms that gave us the best best possible um, secure system. Um, uh, also providing, uh, supporting our clients with, with, with phones and iPads uh, where, where that was needed. And also looking at really creative ways of providing services, like for example, for some young people that needed that face-to-face -face interaction, we, we worked with them in a park, for example, with social distancing. So our, our staff are really creative at making sure, you know, complying with the social distancing, but at the same time, making sure that our clients continue to get the services they needed. Michelle? Oh, sorry, can I just ask um, one follow-up just on that? Um, obviously, it's been a, an, a really difficult time and people seeking different types of financial support um, than they might usually be. During the remote schooling period, did you have people approaching you for that support for that to, to engage with that digital divide? Did you have anyone sort of coming to you seeking support either for themselves or for their families? for, you know, internet and phone expenses. That's right. so it has more been for, you know, for food and for rent um, and for general living expenses rather than specifically, but quite often if we can help out with whatever it might be, food, then that allows extra money to pay for other things, which could include internet and so on expenses. And look, access to technology for children, homeschooling was a really big issue, keeping in mind that um, parents were also working from home using the computer or maybe one only one computer in the household so that was a real issue and we did have um, you know families approaching us for assistance uh, uh, around access to technology and I know at least one of our services did um, form partnership with schools in the area to try and address some of those issues I don't have the details but I'd happy to be happy to provide those later that would be great thank you very much sorry oh no, that's okay um, I want to ask you about your volunteers um, most of, uh, if your if your volunteers are similar to most volunteers across the state, um, a lot of them would have been in the um, uh, older category, which meant that the issues of isolation and um, <clears throat> were significant. How have you? And, but I also know that some services have actually managed to recruit new volunteers through the kind of lockdown period. I'm just I'm, I'm interested in how you're managing the kind of volunteer given you rely so heavily on them, um, yeah, how, how is it, you know, what, what, I suppose what's, what's worked well um, and what are the challenges into the future, if, given you've, you know, you know, as I said, a lot of your volunteers, I'm assuming, have to actually stay away from people rather than be close to people. Um, the average age of our, our volunteers is over 70. So, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, in, they're in the age group where they're vulnerable themselves. So we've... Um, you know, that's been a really significant part of our workforce that has um, had to step away from their, their duties. A lot of them have continued to provide support to um, people over the phone, so just regular welfare checks over the phone. And we've done some work to pair some of our older volunteer groups with younger volunteers who can um, do the, the, the delivery of the good physical goods. Um, and, and yes, we have managed to recruit some 
new volunteers, but overall there's been a significant reduction in our volunteer workforce and that's impacted both our service delivery but also our retail outlets. But, uh, well, look, we have about 30,000 regular volunteers nationally and uh, a big impact for us of course was our Red Shield appeal which uh, normally takes place in May, well it did take place in May, but of course there was no door knock associated with it this year so there was quite a financial impact for the Salvation Army because of that. Um, in our um, financial hardship and housing areas there's less and less volunteers these days um, because of you know professional and other requirements. Um, so for our financial counselling and emergency relief services we're able to um, continue on without any material impact. About four years ago we set up a um, effectively a call centre for emergency relief operating um, out, out of Auburn which provides five days a week um, you know business hours access for people um, staffed by um, employed people so that was able to continue on where some of our local centres uh, volunteers weren't able to continue on they could call that number and and get access to uh, assistance that way. My understanding is that the New South Wales government sort of established a volunteer recruitment app um, during the during that have, have any of your services used that? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not aware of that. Okay. Um, can I ask you about the new people that you're seeing coming through the doors? Um, everyone has um, reflected that there are people who are seeking assistance who have never sought assistance before. Um, our previous um, people who gave evidence this morning talked about single mums who sort of been in shared living arrangements. Are you just able to tell us a little bit about the different types of people um, who are coming through the doors and whether there's particular issues you think need to be addressed at the it's different to the way you would normally provide support? Yeah, I can. Um, look, we've done some research for our um, financial counselling and capability service in particular, the people are, who are actually coming through the door at this stage over April, May and June. And uh, we've found that um, um, COVID-19 clients are more likely to be young, 16 to 24 age group. That's gone from 6% of our client base to 10% of our client base more likely to live in a couple based household or other type household which includes non-related household members like share accommodation, uh, more likely to be born overseas, not to speak English and to be an asylum seeker, refugee or temporary visa holder and less likely to live in public housing as, a, as compared to our traditional clients. So asylum seekers and refugees using our financial counselling related services have gone from 2% to 4% so that's doubled and Temporary visa holders has gone from 2% um, to 6%. For our emergency relief services, it's a little bit more um, anecdotal at this stage, but there was a week there I was advised that 70% um, of the people accessing the service hadn't used that service, the emergency relief service, before, um, you know, um, since at least five years. And just to be clear, your emergency service, that's food. Is that food? Uh, food, yeah. Yep. Uh, assistance with food and rent and things like that, yep. yeah. Yeah, so 70% were, yeah. were not regular, if you like, mm. unusual, different to clients. So, um, yeah, so it, it's quite clear there's a different cohort um, accessing our services now than they have been before. Mm. Okay. Um, so we've seen an increase in people on temporary visas, and that's people seeking asylum, international students, but also some people who are here on tourist visas who caught. And then the other group of people who who don't see themselves as being people that would normally rely on charity. So they've never had to reach out for assistance before. There was a gap at the beginning of the pandemic when people started to lose their job and before government assistance kicked in. And so we were the stopgap for some people during that time. But I think we're quite concerned that we haven't, uh, those people will have to start coming back in through our doors soon as their, any savings are used up and because many of them have high fixed costs. And um, we're also concerned about that overcoming that shame or stigma where pe that prevents some people from reaching out for assistance from charities and what happens when the coronavirus supplement decreases and when the asset test is reintroduced. Yeah, it's worrying times ahead, Ms Nassa. Mm, yeah, likewise. Yeah. Look, we've seen a, a, an increase in, as I said earlier, in uh, demand for our services from domestic family violence, emergency relief, employment, 
impact. Uh, in terms of the profile of, of people who are coming through our services, and we're seeing, um, you know, young people, for example, coming to our youth employment programs who are, you know, for the first time experiencing um, unemployment um, and, and a, a sort of a slightly different cohort to what we, ha we would have seen uh, before, people who may have been, um, you know, have had a history of employment um, and, or, and uh, you know, for the first time um, finding themselves unemployed. Uh, likewise, too, with the temporary visa holders, um, uh, overseas students, we're also seeing an increase uh, for support from, from that cohort as well. That's it for me at the moment. Okay. Any more questions? Not for the moment. Any other questions? Any questions from the government members? I'm interested in the, uh, you probably can't answer it, but in terms of the overseas students, um, I suppose I'm interested in the demographic, uh, in the demographic of that group, and also, uh, in a sense, how many of them are left? Uh, has, has there been an attempt to hang on here, or, or have the majority of them headed back to their to their homes overseas yeah I, I don't have um, numbers around that um, look you hear any anecdotally that, um, um, that that previously they could support themselves at some level um, through um, the gig economy yep. you know through home deliveries and all that sort of stuff but that's that's pretty much you know, gone now or decreased to such an extent where they now are needing to access our sort of services, but unfortunately can't really add much more to it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure in terms of the broader numbers and how many are left. I, I really don't, don't have that information, but we do know that um, that is a vulnerable group of, uh, of, of people I in our community. That. Yeah. 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 Um, and who are, um, you know, seeking support from our services. And, and I suppose in terms of the services that they're seeking, is it principally in the form of food and rental assistance? Is that, is that, the, it's, a, it's a very basic need that they have in terms of getting by? That's the kind of assistance that we've been providing. Yeah. Yeah. Look, at uh, people, um, those sort of folk are also coming um, to our financial counselling services um, as part of that uh, temporary visa holder group. Um, but that, I think at a, at a lower level, I think it is more emergency relief, yeah. food and assistance. Yeah. Yeah. Ms Hurtos, did you have uh, a couple of questions? Yes, I did. Um, thanks very much uh, for your time today and for your um, very valuable um, testimony. Sorry, I'm just pulling up my notes, which seem to have disappeared. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically around food insecurity. I mean, obviously, that I, I understand that you give a broad range of support and, and like I think, Mr Devlin, you said, sometimes people are seeking support for different sources um, because they're redirecting their funds to do other things. I want, I mean, um, and I say this um, knowing that um, Vinnie's in particular gave us some really um, useful uh, insights when we had an inquiry previously into food insecurity. Now, this was obviously before the pandemic, before um, the current economic crisis that has followed. So I'm just interested to get a sense of um, what you see the rates of food insecurity are doing at the moment. <laughs> Anyone? All of you, please. <laughs> I think there's probably been a real shift in the people for whom food security is an issue. Yeah. So normally a lot of the people that um, reach out to us for assistance with food are people who are on New Start or now Job Seeker. And that was just because income didn't cover all of their you know, basic expenses. Mm -hmm. So there's been a reduction from that cohort uh, presenting to us over the last few months. Um, but then there's been... Um, particularly earlier in the pandemic, people who just didn't have access to food, so people who had to self-isolate and didn't have um, family or friends that they could call on. And, um, and then that increase in international students. There's also been a real shift in the, um, in the availability of food security. So Vinnie's has had to close some of our vans and I know in the community other food pantry type services have closed. And so some of our homelessness services have now started to be more active in that space. So there's just been, and there's been a whole lot of volunteer organisations spring up and do some really informal food relief as well. Mm -hmm. So I think measuring at a population level um, would be really challenging because of that enormous level of informal support that's going on. Mm -hmm. I guess a, a 
concern around food security is the, the cliff when income support <coughs> reduces, when JobKeeper ends um, and uh, JobSeeker reduces. So that's uh, that we're not feeling that at the moment uh, to a large extent. Uh, certainly food security, we're experiencing it in terms of access to food and there's been a, an increase in charities providing social meals, including Mission Australia, uh, where we provide social meals because people are in isolation and can't access uh, uh, the food. So there's that aspect of it, as well as the, the panic around buying and supply. So uh, in the early stages in particular, where there was shortages of different aspects of food, we did see uh, families being concerned about running out of food and not being able to, uh, to access the supply of food. Yes, no, I certainly agree. There's, uh, there seems to be a big difference, I think, now between what is happening right now, because we do have government supports right now. We do have a lot of deferrals of payments of all sorts of, uh, of finance payments, of, of rent, of, uh, of energy payments. And when that, when that changes, that's the, that's the big concern. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the debt levels, there's something like over $266 billion in debt deferred at the moment. You know, massive amounts of money. Um, a lot of that with still accruing interest. Um, and, and when all that changes, which, it need, which should, I guess it will, and it's really important, I guess, that all those organisations reach out to their customers to work with them to get in place long-term flexible arrangements. But when that changes, I think that's when there'll be further pressure on our services for things like, you know, direct things like, like food. It was interesting, a, a thing you know, that's coming through our emergency relief services at the moment, apart from food and rent and utilities, is, is motor vehicle costs for the people who are are still driving, um, keeping that car on the road is important, and actually, and tolling as a part of that as well, um, is actually uh, an additional thing that we're seeing for our emergency relief that we weren't seeing particularly before as well. Can I also ask you then? I mean, um, you mentioned um, that some of your retail outlets had 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 um, closed, Miss Cook. That yeah. um, there's obviously it's a very different environment that that we're operating in in this sort of learning to live with COVID world, what are some of the requirements that have been placed on you and the services that you're providing um, to, to continue to operate and to provide support? Is that, is that a really big burden that you're having to um, sort of shoulder or how, can, you, can you explain to us even anecdotally how you're sort of working through those issues? <laughs> look, it, it has been, look, it's been a big thing, I'm sure, for yeah. everyone to... Uh, you know, for, to move to working from home situation. That was a, it was a big um, thing that we had to do, we all had to do um, very quickly. Um, and I think all our, our, um, our team members responded incredibly well. You know, it's been particularly difficult, of course, for people with, uh, with uh, young families in particular and for people who are living by themselves. Um, you know, we had to supply some additional equipment to people. Largely, it was it was pretty good. Most people had laptops and phones, but we had to supply equipment um, to some people. Um, and look, some people are you know, if, you know, just like people in the community, our our team members are exactly the same. They're living in you know one bedroom apartments with you know two kids, and and it's it's busy and difficult um, to work that way. Um, you know, we're moving, which in some areas, um, we're moving back into the office again, and of course there's the, uh, you know, the requirements um, around that for, you know, for shields and distancing. Some of our rooms have found not to be of sufficient space, so that's been difficult. You know, traditionally, our rooms haven't always uh, been big enough, but people, have, our services and people have been responding really well and just um, and getting on with it. But um, um, you know, obviously looking to protect the welfare of our workers, which is uh, critically important, but um, I guess so far, so good, yeah. From a uh, funding requirements perspective, we have seen quite a bit of flexibility from funding, funding uh, bodies um, who have basically um, were prepared to provide some flexibility around the KPIs and the, the uh, particularly where there are particular programs that we're funded to deliver, we're no, uh, no longer able to deliver because of the social distancing, such as community programs or group work or programs that we would run in schools, those sorts of things. So there has been quite a bit of flexibility to, to review those programs um, and the approach uh, to them. In some cases, we needed to stop those programs and, and 
direct our resources to delivering, you know, one-on-one -on -one through, um, you know, virtually. So there has been quite a bit of that flexibility uh, from government agencies. I have to say initially there was quite a bit of confusion. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion initially, you know, should we be closing our site, not closing our site? Um, and But I think that was understandable. You know, we were all operating in a, in a you know, uh, a, an initial sort of uh, state of um, um, uncertainty about where this was heading, but I think that has settled down quite a bit. Sorry, Ms Cook, just before, can I just ask one follow-up, Ms Nasser? You said you ran some programs in schools. What kinds of programs are they that you had to... So we do quite a bit of work with schools through, uh, you know, family mental health support services, through our targeted early intervention programs where we might go in and do some programs with um, with primary school kids or with high school kids. Uh, some of that is, you know, early intervention, mental health support, peer support. So a range of programs. Some of that is one-on-one. -on -one, some of that is pr through uh, group work. Um, and so we, yeah, you know, clearly uh, when schools closed, even when schools reopened, it was difficult to do that because, um, uh, you know, the demand on schools at that time was not the right time for us to be going in there and doing programs. One of the key things we do with schools is a youth survey, which we do annually. Um, and uh, schools normally participate and, um, we, you know, this is where young people through schools conduct that, that survey. Uh, but this year it has been a real challenge um, because of the, you know, the close and open uh, and, the, and the, the pandemic has created some difficulties there. How, can I ask, sorry, just one more question. Yeah. Just in terms of your breakfast programs, are you still able to run those in schools or are they...? Um, I'll have to take that on notice okay. to just find out exactly where they're at. But generally during the, clearly when the schools uh, closed, or clearly not, but even when schools reopened, there was a more limitations around going back in there to do some of those programs. But I can, I can take that specific question on notice in terms of the breakfast programs. That would be great, thanks. And if the new changes, so I know there was like the initial when schools first reopened and now there's been like a, a slight easing of the allowing people on the grounds, whether the, it was allowed during the first tranche or during sure. the second tranche. Yep. Quite sure. awesome. Thank you. you. I'm on. sorry, Ms. Cook, I cut you off before no, you. Fine. Um, I think one of the areas of concern is where our services have had to reduce capacity in order to, to be safe. And I mean, being safe for staff and, and the people that access our services is of utmost importance. But if this eruption of social issues that we're expecting happens, and we know that the many parts of the service of the community sector were already under-resourced and now there's reduced capacity on top of that, how, um, you know, the, there'll be a bigger mismatch between the capacity of services and the level of need in the community. Mm. And how about, how are you, you know, obviously you've got retail outlets and I've seen they're starting to reopen. How is that impacting on, on them? How is sort of operating in a COVID-safe environment impacting on them? Um, I... I don't have a lot of detail on that, but I know many of the stores are operating at reduced hours. Um, just that's a bit of a staffing issue and um, a volunteering issue, but I can get more detail on the, the COVID safe practices that are in place in all of the stores. Oh, that's yeah. fine. Um, Keep going. One last no, question. No. <laughs> we have another 10 minutes of questioning time to go, so okay, if we have any questions, we can... Um, can I just then ask all of you, I mean, Obviously, you're very big organisations operating across the country. Is there anything? Is there anything that we could be doing better that other states are doing? Support that the government is providing that we could be doing here, um, or lessons that we could be learning from that you sort of heard anecdotally from perhaps some of your compatriots in other states, colleagues in other states. Yeah, well, it's a, look, it's a, it, it is a, a big, a big question, and I'm sure there's lots of things. Yeah, you know, it's it's been such a changing time. We've all learned, you know smaller and bigger things during uh, during this time. The Western Australian Government, um, for example, recently um, provided a, um, a package of funding for financial counselling services uh, within the state at a substantial value. There's a, a really good financial counselling program uh, in New South Wales, but uh, there's concern, you know, will that have, um, will that be big enough to meet um, future demand because that that is a big concern where you know it's not just going to be next month it's going to be for the next you know, number of years whatever that is so that's like um, prior to the um to the COVID happening you know we weren't meeting the, the demand then um so it's concerning what's what the future holds for that um and also in the um the no interest loans area again new south wales government provides some some funding in that area 
unlike some other states, which is terrific. Um, but um, as we move away from government supports, the likelihood of predatory lenders coming more and more to the fore, as they have been in the past, uh, they're increasing rapidly. Um, there's concern about that, so to have a strong no interest loans program is really important to provide a, a safe alternative to predatory type debt. Could I just interrupt there, Mr Devlin? This is the problem when you're confronted with a question, what are other states doing better than what we're doing, and vice versa, is you can pick out individual items that some states do, but those other states may not provide programs that in New South Wales are doing. I, not being critical of anyone, but the, this is the whole problem in, in just cherry picking different parts out of it, isn't it? It's, I think all the states have done their best really to, to try and do it, irrespective of the, the political makeup of those states. Everyone is working out what they're doing as they go along, really, well, isn't it? Look, I think so. Well, well right now in particular, I guess, uh, I guess my, um, my thought is to, um, you know, is to plan for the future. Planning yep. for the future is so important. As I say, where, you know, things are, you know, travelling along in circumstances, you know, in the circumstances reasonably sort of well, but as things are changing now in September, October, that's, you know, that's, the, that's the big concern and what, what it's going to look like into the future. Um, just to add to that, uh, I think we, when this pandemic first started, there's a view in all of us that this is you know, a few months and that will all be over. I think we're now realising that this, you know, we're, we're really in this at least for another 12 months, uh, if not longer. Uh, so, so I think we now need to move to a sta stage where we are looking at that longer term or that medium term planning in terms of the preparedness and the and the um, uh, and the response phase, uh, as well as longer term in terms of the recovery phase. So I think we really need to be looking at a more of a medium term plan over the next 12 months. Say, for example, you know we've had support from um, uh, you know the Department of Communities and Justice around additional funding for cleaning for uh, you know PPE things like that so what we need is now okay what does that look like over the next 12 months and and potentially a more of a coll coll collective pro um, a whole of government approach around this so that we're not do dealing with a small amount of funding from health a small amount of funding from DCJ and all of that has an administrative burden uh, on organizations so potentially over the next 12 months you know can we look at a, a you know New South Wales government support sort of package recognizing that we are going to be in this for the next 12 months at a minimum in terms of supporting organizations like ours but but other organizations as well particularly smaller organizations uh, in in preparing and responding to the pandemic, um, I think the other the other area, as I mentioned in my uh, my opening statement, is we do need clearer protocols around residential services in outbreak management. At the moment, we have really good uh, guidelines, and the you know Department of Health and uh, DCJ and the the sector have been working closely together around homelessness services and providing guidelines for those services. But what we really need is clearer protocols. Uh, I know in the South Australian government has provided very clear commitments uh, around um, hospitalising people who are high risk, who, uh, who are positive in, in, uh, in aged care facilities. Uh, but what we're saying is in relation to homelessness facilities, particularly where there are shared services, as well as in aged care facilities that are higher risk, we need really clear protocol around uh, hospitalising people very early on, because the evidence is showing that if that happens very early on, that that can help uh, reduce the spread, but also can prepare those organisations to better respond and manage the a surge workforce uh, and, and get ready to, to, to deal with the outbreak. Um, I guess there are two things I'd like to highlight. One is investment in social housing. So it, uh, the lack of access to affordable and appropriate housing is one of the biggest blockers for many parts of the service system. And, and you know, when I talk to service managers about good outcomes for the people they assist, often it's housing that's the kind of the insurmountable barrier. So I think New South Wales government has the, the opportunity to lead the way there. And, um, you know, we've seen that with the response to people experiencing homelessness, but this is an opportunity, you know, that's a demonstration of what can be done when there's will and commitment and resources to back that up. Um, so let's, let's translate that into a long-term win. 
And the other area is support for people on temporary visas, and that's really a federal government responsibility. But in the absence of um, any any support um, coming from the federal government, the New South Wales government has made a financial contribution. But particularly for people seeking asylum, returning to their home country is not an option. And, um, you know, they need to live. Michelle. Sarah, I'm just interested in your observation about very clear guidelines. Let me, let me just give an example. I'm in my 60s now, so when we're talking about my parents, you're talking pretty old. Um, um, my mother would be offended at that, I think, at 1993. <laughs> I've got one uh, uh, parent who's 93, fit, active, although run over, fit, active, uh, uh, high functioning mentally. Uh, I had a father who was very severely incapacitated as a, very severely incapacitated as a stroke, both in terms of physical incapacity and mental incapacity as a result. He's now passed away. Uh, and I, I have another relative with now quite severe dementia. I'm interested in talking about uh, inviting your comment with regards to clear protocols as to what you should do with those three people. If my mother is not in a nursing home, she is self-sustaining at home. But it seems to me you can talk about clear protocols, but actually what you do with those three people may be quite different um, because of the circumstances in which they find. The person who's got severe d d dementia, for instance, may be, quite, m may be quite troublesome in terms of moving into a hospital environment. Uh, my father, severe physical incapacity, you would not have moved him. Uh, uh, and, the, and the family would have grossly disagreed with moving him from the nursing home. So I, I'm just, you know, in a sense, inviting. Is your clear protocol actually realistic when you look at the diversity of people who find themselves in sort of institutionalised care? Uh, of course, the uh, client-centred um, response is, is fundamental, that you need to consider the exact circumstances, you need to consider the needs of the Individual, but you also need to balance that with the broader safety of the community and the safety of other residents and staff within that facility. So, and that is complex, and we recognise that that is complex. But I guess what we need is really clear protocols so that we don't get to a point where there's an outbreak and we're still trying to argue or, or, or work out is hospitalisation a, a good thing or not a good thing. As we have seen, and we've seen this in, in other examples, uh, I know in, the, um, uh, in, in one of the earlier outbreaks that there's at the Dorothy Lodge, uh, one of the uh, key success factors in that management of that outbreak was early hospitalisation, was that the health and the facility and the Commonwealth worked very closely together to, uh, to move to an early hospitalisation as early as possible. And that was a real success factor mm -hmm. in the management of the outbreak in that facility. So I guess what we need is really clear protocol, not just guidelines, but some clear protocols that really outline that, yes, there is a principle a principal commitment to hospitalisation early. Of course, recognising that you need to assess the circumstances of, both, of individuals, the needs of those individuals, you need to assess the uh, their choices, you need to also assess the, the, um, the impact on the broader facility as well. So it is a complex um, case and, and, and of course we do need to consider all the various aspects of it. Um, but, I, but yeah, but it's, it's more about making sure that hospitalisation is, is uh, uh, an early Early solution um, because there's evidence that it that it does work at preventing um, the outbreak getting out of control. Michelle. Um, my last question is actually about the EAT program. I hope you didn't cover it while I was not in the room. I apologise, I had to step out. Um, I mean the EAT program uh, very important around people meeting their particularly their winters um, heating and electricity bills in the incoming areas. It, it, do you have any suggestions to the committee about the current administration of that um, uh, that program or what you expect to be rising need in coming months about this? Um, there, there, is, there are some, some concerns about the program. It, it seems to have changed um, um, in recent times. I think before, uh, just before COVID crisis hit, um, there were some 
some changes uh, in the administration of the program, which seems to have tightened up mm. some of the areas. Um, so we're, we're keen, very keen to sit down with the, um, with the government other service providers to, to work through that because it does seem to be some... I mean, I'm aware that some service providers are actually withdrawing from the program because they've found it too hard to administer. Yeah. Yeah. And Vinnie's is one of those service providers. Yeah. Yeah, could you? I mean, I, I mean, I'm interested in. It. I mean, we've seen such good flexibility and and working with people's needs. This seems to be going in a direct opposite direction. So, could, are you able to tell the committee about the difficulties that Minis have had with it? I should say that, firstly, I guess the main reason for us having to withdraw from the program is that we delivered it almost entirely through our member volunteers mm. and who are older, as I said before, and for whom technology is a real balance, um, challenge. So for them being able to take up this new phone assessment process um, meant that a lot of people just thought that they couldn't continue to deliver the program, which meant that we were relying much more heavily on our staff at a time when our resources were already stretched. So there was a capacity is probably the biggest thing, but that coincided with, I guess, more onerous assessment process and more administrative demands on our organisation. And not to say that there wasn't um, perhaps the need for, for more oversight of the EPA program, but those two things coinciding at the same time just meant for us, we made the decision to withdraw for this financial year, but um, you know, there's still the potential that we'd participate again in the future. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really a really good program. It's better than many other states have, it, but it seems like it needs a little bit of uh, further consideration at the moment. You know, we know that um, those winter winter bills are, are coming in. Um, with people working from home, um, there's going to be some some shocks around those bills. So, uh, yeah, it, it would be great to um, to have a, a good conversation about that to get those issues sorted out. All right, well, time for questions having uh, now elapsed. Uh, I thank the three witnesses for attending. The committee has resolved that answers to questions taken on notice be returned within 21 days. The Secretariat will contact you in relation to the questions you have taken on notice. Um, questions will resume at the next round at 11.45am. Thank you. Thank you.